into our second talk tonight. This is all about the secret world of flute making. So please give a huge welcome to the stage, Linda Watkins. Come on up. All right, let's talk about flutes. So um, just to introduce myself, I work in marketing at a startup in Palo Alto. That's the boring part of me. The interesting part is that I am a big flute nerd. So I played flute for 30 years. I have two degrees in flute performance. I worked for four years at a flute manufacturing company. And my idea as for fun in high school was to get together with my best friend and play flute duets on Saturday. So <laughs> this talk, I guess, is a long time coming. Um, so I want to start at the beginning. Flutes are very old. This is a bone flute. So pretty much as long as there have been bones and hollow sticks around for people to poke holes in, there have been flutes. The oldest currently known flute is 42,000 years old. That's from a, I think a vulture bone flute. So they've been around for a long time. I'm going to skip thousands of years ahead because nothing quite much happened until the 17th and 18th century. So these are flutes from 17th and 18th century. Um, they started adding a couple more things like an extra key because at this time you were limited to, you know, how many fingers you have, how many tone holes you can have on a flute. So Flutes were, when they were made during these centuries, they were made in certain keys. Popular ones were the key of D or the key of G, which meant that if you were playing a flute in the key of D and you need to play in a different key, that was almost impossible or very difficult or it sounded really bad. Um, so they started adding some extra keys. There was a G sharp key, a D sharp key, but you know there wasn't any real um, new invention going on with flutes yet. Um, so because of these flutes being somewhat out of tune, it was difficult to play all the notes. One of the most famous composers of this time, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, he ended up saying, what's even worse than a flute? Two flutes. <laughs> I think that's the original dad joke. <laughs> So Mozart got over this because he ended up writing two gorgeous flute concertos. He wrote a lot of flute solos in his orchestral works and he even wrote an opera called The Magic Flute. So it came redeemed in the end. Um, but that leads us into the 19th century of flute making. So in the, the 1830s, there's the father of the modern flute. So a German guy named Theobald Berm. So he was the son of a goldsmith. And he was also a flutist. And he studied acoustics at the University of Munich. So he kind of had this trifecta of perfect information to reinvent the flute. So what he did is he created a mechanism for the flute that allowed it to play all the notes in a chromatic scale. And when I say chromatic scale, what I mean is in Western music, if you look at a piano and you go from a C, a low C to a high C, you're going to be playing 12 notes. So if you count your fingers, we only have 10 fingers. So before this time, it was impossible to play all 12 notes really well on a flute. So he came up with this mechanism and it, he worked it all out mechanically so that you can play all 12 notes on the flute. And essentially, this is the modern flute today. Even 100 plus years later, we're still using this mechanism because he did such a good job inventing it. So the flute today has a range of just over three octaves. It has 16 to 20 openings for keys, depending on what model you're looking at. We've kind of added a couple extra keys through the years. They're made today out of silver, gold, or platinum. Um, I brought some that I'll show you and demonstrate a little bit later. Um, <laughs> during this time, he made them out of wood. Um, grenadilla wood is a type of African wood that was very popular. And I brought a piccolo, actually, out of grenadilla wood. So, yes, 
piccolo. The piccolo is half the size of a flute. I know this flute looks a little bit longer, because it is, it has an extra key. Um, half the size means uh, it's an octave higher. It's double the frequency. So piccolos are fun to play in a large room, not so fun to play if you're sitting right next to one. So we've talked about flute manufacturing and invention in you know the early 1800s, but that was all in, in Europe and Germany. So we need to talk about what brought it to America. So flute making in America, and by that I mean flute making in Boston. Because all of the high-end great American flute makers are in Boston. Why would that be? It all started with the Haynes brothers in 1888. So they wanted to learn how to make a flute because one brother was a flutist, one brother was a silversmith, so it seemed like a perfect combination. So they, they got together, they got an old flute from, it was a Barm flute from Germany, and how are you gonna learn flute making in the 1800s? You're just gonna copy what somebody else did. So they made their flute, first flute and started their flute factory in 1888. So the only way to learn flute making at that time and still today is to either figure it out for yourself or learn from one of these flute makers. So Vern Powell, um, he was also a silversmith and a flutist. He wanted to learn how to make a flute. So he made the famous spoon flute. He took seven silver spoons, three watch cases, and a handful of silver dollars. He melted it down and he made a flute. <laughs> they still have it today um, at the Powell Flute Company. I've never heard it played, but I imagine it's maybe a little rough, but <laughs> it was enough to impress um, the Haynes brothers and they hired him at their factory and he worked there for years and did really well, but then he broke off in 1927 to start his own flute company and is still doing really well today and you can go and visit in, in Boston, Haynes as well. Um, so Powell, then a lot of flutists got, started going to Powell and that brings us to the Brennan brothers. If you can't tell, flutists kind of stick with the family. <laughs> So Bickford and Robert Brennan, they, they got a job at Powell, they learned how to make flutes, and they broke off and did their own thing in 1977. Um, Jim Phelan and Lillian Burkhardt also did the same thing. Jim Phelan co-owned Powell Flutes for a couple years. That's where he met Lillian. They, she worked there, they got married, they broke off and they started their own flute company. And Burkhardt Phelan is the company that I worked for for four years. So, maybe cartel is a little bit of a strong word, but they all work together, at least they did at first. So Haynes started it all, and they're still going strong. They have a Boston presence, and you, if you're ever in Boston, you can go and visit all the flute shops. So from them, Powell broke off, from Powell, Brennan broke off, and from Powell, Burkhart failing broke off. So in the early years, um, there was international, especially Japanese flute maker, and they decided they were going to squash the Japanese flute makers. So, you know, they kind of had an agreement how they were going to do things, and they were pretty successful, actually. They, um, they really kind of overtook the high end of the market, and they still do today, of American flutes. So I want to talk a little bit about what is flute making, what are the jobs, what does it look like? Um, it is a little bit like assembly line, assembly line manufacturing, only the fact that you don't have one artisan sit down and make an entire flute. Um, it's broken up in four sections. So there's a body maker, a stringer, a patter, and a head joint maker. Whenever I say this, it reminds me of the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. But this is specific to flutes. Um, all high-end flutes are handmade, meaning you have somebody sitting at a desk actually putting it all together because of the tight tolerances that you need. They do machine a lot of the pieces nowadays, like the keys and the rods and the posts and things like that, um, but somebody needs to put it all together. 
So that brings me to the body maker. Um, this looks like a 14 karat rose gold body. And modern flutes today, they still can make them out of wood, but that's less popular. So really the metallic flutes are the most popular. And they'll experiment with all sorts of different materials. So you'll have sterling silver, which is 92.5% silver um, alloyed with other metals. They have 998 silver, which is 99.8% silver. And they use a process of powder metallurgy to get that together. Um, and they use gold, 14 karat, 10 karat, I've seen 22.5 karat gold flute and platinum. So the different materials have different acoustic properties. And I'll talk more about that when I do a demonstration. Flutes, high-end flutes range in price from 12,000 to 40,000. So it's actually chump chains compared to violins. So I am a little bit grateful there. But um, my flute is a Brennan body and a Burkhardt head joint that I made when I was at the factory. Um, the body I bought 25 years ago, the head joint I made 10 years ago. And so today that flute would probably be, I don't know, maybe 15 grand or so. <laughs> yeah. You notice I set it back from the stage. <laughs> So the stringer, the stringer puts all the key work together and um, a lot of these keys are manufactured nowadays. In the past they were cast, um, which is kind of a tricky process, but today they have these big machines that they, um, CNC machines that they mill out the material for the keys. And modern flutes, um, even though the basic mechanism is just like um, Theobald inv invented 170 years ago or so. Um, modern flute makers have added some extra special things and they like crazy names like the gizmo key or the half offset G, uh, the B foot or the C sharp trill key. Um, so they add all these extra bells and whistles. The patter, this is where everything starts to come together. So tone holes basically are the openings in the flute. And you, when you press down the keys, you have to make a tight seal. It has to be um, airtight so that nothing leaks through. Um, so the patter's job is to make sure those felt or synthetic pads match perfectly where they need to go. And then comes the best job of all, the head joint maker. That was me. <laughs> um, I was talking with a friend and she's like, you know what, the head joint maker is like the sommelier of sound. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I was. I didn't have to go through as difficult a certification process, but that's okay. Um, so this is where I really want to talk about the art and the science of flute making. It really is, in my mind, kind of magical because the science part of it is very clear. I mean, you don't mess with physics and math. Um, if you put a tone hole, a hole in a flute, then that is going to give you a certain pitch because it's based on the length of the instrument that you're working with. So. If you have a longer tube, it's going to be a lower pitch. A shorter tube is going to be a higher pitch. That's just physics, and that's not going to change. So you have to place all of these tone holes in the exact right acoustical place in order to get the right pitch. If you change the position, it changes the pitch. But <clears throat> the artistic side of it is when um, a flutist would come to me and say, I want a warm, soft sound or I want something really mellow, or I want bright, I want a bright sound. So how do you translate that as a flute maker into the sound that they're actually getting? For one, it's subjective because bright to me may be different bright to them, but you kind of figure this out as you go. So there are things you can do to play with that sound when you're making the head joint. And the reason the head joint is the most important part of the flute when it comes to the actual tone color of the flute is because it's closer to where the sound production starts. That's where your mouth is, that's where you start blowing. So if you change the material of the head joint, it actually changes the tone color of the sound. And what I mean by tone color is when you hear a G major scale played on a clarinet, <clears throat> 
and a G major scale played on a flute, even if they were behind a screen, many of you would probably be able to tell, oh, there's a difference. They sound different. A clarinet sounds different than a flute. Um, that has to do with tone color, and that is about probably another talk another time because it gets very complicated, so I won't go into all the details. But when you change the material of a flute, it changes the tone color. So the way that I would describe it is a gold flute does sound warmer. It sounds a little softer. It sounds richer, like a more full harmonic spectrum. But a silver flute carries better, like a large orchestral hall. It is a little bit brighter, maybe a little bit more edgy. But then there are also things you can do with how you're cutting the head joint, the instrument here, like making um, the blowing angle a little bit sharper on this lip plate. Um, there's also what is called a riser that connects the lip plate to the body of the flute. You can kind of tweak the undercutting of that angle a little bit and that changes the sound. So all of this really plays into the artistic side of making an instrument. And as especially a head joint maker, I had to figure that out, like understand the science, but then as a player, tune into the artistic side of it. So what a lot of players do now is that they'll go to one of these flute factories, they'll choose a the flute they want, but then they'll sit there for an hour or two and switch out head joints um, until they find the one that's just right for them. It's like customized just for them. So this is me. I was the head joint princess from 2002 to 2006. So if anybody happens to have a Burkhart flute or head or a piccolo from that time, I made your head joint. <laughs> oh, they probably make uh, 200 flutes a year. And by the time I left, they were doing more piccolos because they introduced another one. So maybe another 200 piccolos a year. And I would make additional head joints um, so that people had more choices. And one flute probably takes total man hours, 130 hours to make. Yeah. Um, so the flute weighs between one and 1 1.5 pounds, depending on what it's made of. Gold flutes, of course, are heavier than silver flutes. Um, I like describing flutes as they really are jewelry that sings. Um, you can't find a lot of people that have previous flute making experience. So when these flute factories are hiring, they'll look for people that have made jewelry before because actually that is very close to making a flute. You just have to make it beautiful and it needs to sound beautiful. So I want to answer a burning question that I think everybody is just wanting to know and don't Google it. Is it flutist or flautist? I get this question a lot. I want people to answer, or raise their hand. If you think it's flutist, raise your hand. Okay, if you think it's flautist, raise your hand. Okay, about half and half. The answer is... Either one. Either one is correct. You can say flutist or flautist or flautist. But really, it's flutist. <laughs> because... <laughs> flautist is a more British way of saying it. People in England say that. In America, professional pl flute players call themselves flutist. So if you want to sound British and always speak in a British accent, by all means, say flautist. <laughs> so right now I want to take a minute to give a demonstration. And I will say this is probably the one and only time that classical flute music will be heard in this venue. <gasps> Not true. Who was the other classical flutist? So give me one second. I'm going to be playing a Bach sonata, a second movement. And I would have played something jazzy, but I'm not a jazz flutist, so I'm just going to own what I am, and I'm a classical flutist. So here we go. How about Jamie? Take request.
I'll show you the difference. I'm going to play, I'll play something simple on flute and play the exact same thing on piccolo so you can first hear that it's an octave higher. happening with 3D printing and flute making. And I don't know for sure, but um, I know Jim Phelan, who is one of the owners of Burkhart Phelan Flutes, and he is really big into using the latest gadgets and everything, so I, I'm almost positive he's doing something with it. At least experimenting. More questions? Yeah. Um, is tone of flute mainly uh, personal preference, or is it like genre-based, like a jazz studio and then play a certain tone versus a uh, classical yeah. flute? The question was around tone of flute, um, and if there's a different tone for a classical versus jazz flutist, and yes, definitely. There's a, a different tone you would want playing classical, which is typically a little bit cleaner or very clear and precise, and the tone for jazz flute is a little bit more relaxed and maybe a little bit more airy. A lot of saxophonists double on jazz flute, so if you hear a great jazz flutist, it's probably a saxophonist playing flute really well. Yeah. Is there a requirement for professional orchestras on a certain degree of the Um, Is there a requirement for pre professional orchestras? So to get into professional orchestra on flute is very, very competitive, which is why I'm not playing in an orchestra and I'm working in marketing instead. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I tried it for a few years and then I realized there's a handful of great orchestras in the nation. and. There's only three flute positions, and you have to wait for someone to die or retire before there's a position open. And then there's 200, 300 flutists applying for one job. I don't know why it took me, like, three degrees to figure that out. But, you know, eventually I figured it out. Um, so, yes, you have to play, like, absolutely in tune, perfect notes. It's very, very competitive to get in an orchestra. Yeah? Uh, yes, you talked about length and how that affects pitch. In regards to sheer performance, uh, how does girth play in, and what is more important, length or girth? <laughs> what is more important, length or girth? <laughs> I feel like I could win with any one of these answers. <laughs> well... <laughs> Um, I'm not sure exactly why they determined that the size of the bore um, was just so, but it's very well established that this is the standard size of the flute. And so really the only thing you could change, and that would change the pitch, so the length is pretty set as well. <laughs> yeah, one more question. Yeah. Uh, what was the learning curve like for learning how to actually make these head joints, like you said, and how often would you mess up in the beginning, and what did you get them made back to at the end? Okay, that's a good question. What was the learning curve in making the instruments? Um, by that time, I had already played for years and years, so um, it was pretty fast for me because I knew the mechanism in the instrument very, very well. Um, I just had to learn the actual technique of how do you file here and how do you solder and that type of thing. So it happened fairly fast. Um, and there was another part of the question. Oh yes, I did mess up sometimes. So it's really kind of disheartening when you mess up with 14 karat rose gold <laughs> and you have to melt it down and send it back to the, to the factory to, to smelt and then put back in the, um, a lip plate or a tube again. So that happened a couple of times. Um, this part is soldered, meaning that you take an open flame and you take a soldering, um, it's a silver solder or a gold solder, whichever one you're working with at the time, and you'll um, solder on this lip plate to the body of the flute. And But if you get it too hot, it's called like scaling, will get on the instrument. Or in worst case, I did this once, I actually melted the lip plate. So that was definitely one that you toss in the recycle bin. Oh. <laughs> 
Okay, I think I think we're out of time. So thank you very much. <laughs>